Thank you. Tato, thank you for that warm introduction. Skip, thank you. Uh, because it's not really part of my immediate history, Tato didn't realize he's from Botswana and my family is from South Africa, so we share uh, even that much more in common. Uh, so it is a, a real honor to be, uh, to be introduced by a fellow African. I, I identify no matter where I am with something. I'm an African some days, I'm Canadian other days, I'm, uh, I'm an American other days. Um, I moved to the United States about 12 years ago. Uh, but since my beautiful wife is here and I, uh, I got married to an American, I, I easily associate with being an American as well. Thank you for your warm welcome. It's an honor to be here, uh, to be back in Little Rock uh, and to see the changes that have occurred over the last few years. Uh, earlier today, Lori and I had a chance to tour the library uh, next door. It is a great uh, tribute to the Clintons and a remarkable addition to, to Little Rock. This is truly uh, a beautiful and enjoyable place to be and uh, it's such a privilege to me to be here tonight, uh, and, and I appreciate that you've all come out to see me. Uh, this being 2013, I want to give you my Twitter handle and tell you that while I look forward to taking your questions after my remarks uh, and getting into a, a robust dialogue with you, I do enjoy engaging people via social media, so if it strikes you to offer a comment later or uh, you feel you can be more sufficiently insulting, or complimentary via social media. <clears throat> I almost always ref, uh, respond to compliments, and I definitely always respond to insults. Uh, please feel free to tweet me at Ali Velshi or uh, on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash Ali Velshi. I can't respond to everything directed at me, but I do try to see everything, and I, uh, I really get a lot out of learning what people have to say. Some people like doing it in public forums, and other, people's, other people like to do it a little differently. So please feel free to be in touch with me. It's at Ali Velshi. I know you get a lot of famous people through here, and once in a while, just to keep you humble, uh, you've got to put up with somebody like me. Uh, a little less famous, a little less accomplished, but I am an observer to those things that matter most to all of us, uh, particularly as they surround the economy, and that's why you're stuck listening to me this evening. Uh, I'm going to give you a snapshot of the economy and give you a sense of what I'm doing now. Tato spent a little time talking about this. I spent 12 years at CNN. I was the chief business correspondent there for both CNN US and CNN International, and I was an anchor for both channels. Until earlier this year when I left, I hosted a weekly show on CNN called Your Money. It was on on the weekends. Anybody ever see that? All right. And then uh, for those of you who traveled internationally, I anchored a daily show. It was called World Business Today, uh, and it was uh, prime time. You know, it showed everywhere else in the world except the United States, but it was prime time basically India through Japan. In May, I left CNN with a heavy heart uh, to join uh, and help Al Jazeera America launch. We launched on August the 20th, um, and I've hosted a nightly show there called Real Money with Ali Velshi. It's on at 6 p.m. Central. Uh, for those of you who are Comcast subscribers, it should be uh, channel 107, is that right? 107? Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that show in Al Jazeera in a few minutes. But mostly I discuss the economy. And that includes markets, companies, finance, housing, energy, jobs, education, taxes, budgets, all that kind of thing. My target audience uh, is people who are busy with their lives, generally speaking not involved in the world of finance, but they need to understand economic trends, they need to make smart decisions that will allow them to prosper, and they need to understand those things that might present them with financial danger. But my assumption is that people who tune in to me are not following markets, they're not watching CNBC, they're not watching Bloomberg, but as we've all learned since 2007, the margin for error in not understanding economic trends is much smaller than it used to be. This is now a responsibility that falls upon all of us to at least understand what's out there, and frankly, I believe that my audience, who may not have access to a financial advisor, who may not read the business press, uh, and who may not be wealthy, have should have the same access to opportunity uh, to prosper as anybody else. And they should know what these larger trends are uh, and that they don't read the latest books on these things and don't follow the nuances doesn't mean that they should be protected from danger any less or exposed to opportunity any less. So my audience ranges from the financially sophisticated to the financially illiterate. Uh, the point of my show is that it should be accessible and useful to anybody who watches it uh, and when I say useful, it means it could save you money, it make you money, it could make you seem smart in front of your boss or uh, a potential date, uh, could help you get a job. Um, you know, there's a lot of ranges to what useful is, but it is not a markets or a finance show. It's a money show, and last I checked, most of us need money. 
So probably the most common question I get is how I think the economy is going. And I think this is an interesting question because pretty much anybody asking it uh, should know for him or herself. The economy is in part a monolith that affects us all, but really, how do you feel about the economy? I get this, this question in cabs all the time. And I think to myself, I bet you this cabbie knows more about what's going on in the economy than I do just by the trends in their own business, particularly in New York City. But that's the question I get, and the fact that I get that question means two things. It either means that people think I know more about the economy than they do, or they want validation for what they're feeling. Or perhaps it's because they keep hearing the economy is going gangbusters and it's not their experience. So they're wondering whether they are outliers. Now either way, here's what I tell them. The economy as measured by growth in gross domestic product, GDP growth, which is the broadest measure, as you know, of all goods and services produced in the United States. The economy as measured by growth in GDP is good. It's not great. It's not bad. It's good. And generally speaking, it's getting better. Back in the day when we had a healthy and growing middle class, this measure mattered more than it does today because growth in GDP, GDP reflected generally growth amongst most members of society. But now we've got a bit of a problem and it's not as clear a measure as it used to be. What you have today is observers and economists telling you that GDP growth is good, while on one side of the economic spectrum, you've got those with access to capital telling you this economy is quite possibly the best one they have ever seen. You have access to capital, low interest capital, or you're already wealthy, you have more opportunities and have had more opportunities over the last five years than possibly at any time in over a generation. On the other side, you have probably close to 50% of the population with no access to, access to excess capital no access to the stock market, no access to property and the inability to get a mortgage, uh, they feel that the recession, which started exactly six years ago, never ended. We've got the shrinking middle and this increasingly economic bifurcated economy. So on my show, I often use the analogy of a three-legged stool of prosperity. I, don't, I should have brought one. Um, <clears throat> basically, for a three-legged stool to work, all three legs need to be attached and solid. But for those of you who have three-legged stools, you can actually sit on a three-legged stool even if two of the legs are solid, and with care, you can actually sit on a three-legged stool with one of them. You've got to balance more, but you can, you need one. If all three are working, your stool's good, you're prosperous. If one's working, you can still prosper, but it's, it's tough. But let me just tell you about these three legs of prosperity. The one, the one leg that you need is that the value of your savings or your investments are increasing at a rate faster than inflation. Pretty simple. Number two, the value of your real property, generally speaking your home, is also rising at a rate faster than inflation. And number three, you have a wage that increases annually at a rate faster than inflation. Those three things are happening, you will feel prosperous. They're happening, and, and for many people, those three things have happened at the same time for a long time. For some people today, those three things are happening. <clears throat> Let's talk about how solid those legs of the economy are right now, starting with the stock market. As of today, the S&P 500, which is the most commonly referred to broad index of large cap U.S. stocks, is up 27% to date. Okay? That is closing in on three times the long-term annual average performance of, of large cap U.S. stocks. The Dow is up 23%. And the NASDAQ, which is <clears throat> driven uh, in, in large part by technology companies, is up 35% so far this year. Well, that NASDAQ is at a level that we haven't seen in 13 years and is approaching its all-time high, which was set right before the tech bubble burst. The Dow and the S&P are setting all-time records on a daily basis. They didn't set a record today, but they have been, generally speaking, almost every day for the last uh, several weeks. Had you invested in the stock market when no one wanted to, back on March 9th of 2009, which anybody who remembers me from TV back then, I was telling people they should, uh, and I wrote a book to prove it. Um, uh, if you had invested back then, you'd have more than doubled your money, a lot more than doubled your money on the S&P 500, more than tripled it in the NASDAQ. But had you invested on March 9th, 2009, uh, that would have meant two things. It would have meant that you had money to invest back then and that you were willing to be greedy when others were fearful. For many Americans, neither of those preconditions applied. And today, fewer than 50% of all Americans have any exposure whatsoever to the stock market. 
Now, many people don't invest because they don't have the money to do so, and many don't invest because they don't trust the markets. The second one is the one I have more trouble with because I think you have good reason sometimes not to trust the markets and some of the players in the markets, but the facts are the facts. Had you invested back then, you would have made money. So we can have all sorts of arguments as to whether markets are moral and people are thieves, but the fact is there are ways in which you can advance, and we need to think about that very sensibly. We need to understand money in a way that we're not frightened by it. And I wrote my second book based on that, the idea that people are intimidated by money. They're even intimidated about conversations about money with their own family, their own kids, their own spouses. Okay, that's the one stool, markets, money, investing. The second stool is housing. The second leg on the stool, I'm sorry, is housing. Thanks in large part to the Federal Reserve's three forays into quantitative easing, mortgage rates, though they are higher than they were at the beginning of the year, are still at historically low levels. The combination of low rates and until a couple of years ago, low home prices in many markets, has created a situation whereby homes on a national level are more affordable than they have been in 15 years. Some of the hardest hit markets in the country, Miami, Atlanta, Phoenix, Las Vegas, and several California, Southern California cities have seen remarkable price recoveries as foreclosure inventory is reduced. Even Detroit's suburbs are experiencing what some observers are calling a bubble, while the city itself continues to struggle. Now there are clouds around, or there's a cloud inside that silver lining of a housing recovery. Many depressed properties have been bought up by major investment firms at auction, and that those bidding techniques have meant that a lot of average Americans have been priced out of the process. They have not able to buy foreclosed homes at auction because where they're going up in $500 increments at an auction, uh, a representative from Blackstone or, or Goldman Sachs, they all have holding companies, they don't, they're not there as Blackstone or Goldman, uh, will bid up in $5,000 increments, uh, and thereby it becomes a bidding war between the representatives of those major investment firms who are collecting houses uh, and renting them out, creating a, a real uh, a different situation. Now on the bright side, these major investors have put a floor on home prices in the most depressed areas, which is why in, in places like Atlanta, there's a real floor that's been put into this market. It was a really overbuilt market. Uh, it is probably the biggest city uh, that has become the focus of these, uh, these investors, and, and there's a real floor in the market. Property prices have been increasing in Atlanta <coughs> over the last several months. Uh, on the downside, we're not quite sure how, when, and under what conditions these investment companies are planning to unload their investments, and I worry that they might do it in an unorderly fashion, which will once again depress home prices. Now, I have no reason to think they will, because these companies are populated by some of the smartest investment minds around. Um, but those are the same investment minds that we thought would not work against their own best interests back in 2007 and 2008 during the foreclosure crisis, and clearly the banks did. They hurt themselves and the economy uh, deeply because they didn't operate in their own best interests. So I, I, there's a part of me now that is that has built-in worry about the fact that the highest paid and smartest financial minds in the country don't often make the right decision. So I, I worry that if they decide that they're going to take their inventory of uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of houses between a few companies and decide they're getting out of the business of housing because gold's more interesting or emerging markets are more interesting, it, it, it could be <coughs> disorderly for the housing market. Okay, so second leg uh, was housing. We have investments, we have housing. Both of those legs on a three-legged stool can be broken for the stool to still work. The third leg has to be there. The third and most important leg, <clears throat> by the way, I apologize, I've been suffering with this cough for a couple of weeks, so <clears throat> I apologize for that. The third and most important leg is a job, a wage. Unless you're already wealthy, or you rob a bank, or you marry a rock star, you need a wage. And far too many people in America don't have one, and far too many more people don't have a good one. The issue of jobs, and not the federal deficit and debt, as many people would have you believe, is the single intractable economic issue of our time. With full, willful employment, if you had full employment, we talk about full employment, by the way, as being 5%. We can agree or disagree on that, but that's what economists say. If you had full employment, the number of people on government assistance drops dramatically, income tax receipts rise, demand rises, businesses expand, deficits shrink, and debt comes down. Fairly simple. In a perfect world, taxes could potentially come down as well, but taxes don't come down in a vacuum. Job creation, not debt reduction, needs to be the starting point. Now, on the bright side, the United States has created jobs every single month 
for the last, well, more than three years now. And lately, those job creation numbers have been approaching levels which, if sustained, would reduce unemployment rates. But the unemployment rate in a dynamic changing economy like we have today is actually the least important job number out there. I tend to tell my viewers to ignore that rate entirely. It's just a political football. Whether it goes from 7.2% up to 7.3 or down to 7.1 doesn't actually matter. I want people to look at two other numbers. The number of new jobs created per month, net new jobs created per month, is a much more important number. Because America has more people of working age coming into the economy every month than it has people passing on or retiring. So most economists will tell you that we need somewhere between 150 and 200,000 net new jobs a month just to keep things level. So I don't care what happened to the unemployment rate. I need to know how many net new jobs were created. Just to keep the unemployment rate where it is, we need 150 to 200,000. Uh, in this last election, we had two presidential candidates both offer to create uh, what was that, 12 million jobs over five years or something like that. It worked out to 250,000 jobs a month, which we haven't created for a very long time in this country. And I sort of, uh, challenging both candidates, I'd said on my show that I'll wear a dress for a week if that happens. Now, it'll be the happiest week of my life. If I'm wearing a dress to celebrate the fact that we created a quarter million jobs a month for four years, you know what, then that's fine, I'll wear a dress. But I, 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 I get very uncomfortable that people make these promises that have no real basis in reality. It's not that we can't create 250,000 jobs a month in America, it would take something very different than what's going on right now in order to do so. Um, more important though than the jobs created number is something called the labor force participation rate. Now this is not very sexy and very few people talk about it, but I, I like it a lot. It's the percentage of people who could be working who are working. That's why the unemployment rate is so misleading because when you hear, and I've heard this many times, when people say the unemployment rate's about 7%, that makes it sound like 93% are working. It's not true. There are always people who could be working who don't work. Uh, some of them are in school. Some of them are in jail. Some of them are homemakers. Some of them are so rich that they don't have to work. But there are always people who otherwise could be employed who are not employed. The unemployment rate doesn't account for many of those people who fall into those categories, particularly those who are so disillusioned about getting a job that even without another viable reason not to look for work, for instance, being in jail would be a viable reason not to look for work, um, they, do, they just don't. So the labor force participation rate in the United States is now at a 35-year low. It was above 66% before the recession. So that's when times were good, by the way. When times were good, 66 or 67% of the population that could be working was working. I mean, think about it. Somebody takes retirement a few years earlier, they are counted in that number. So they are somebody who could be working who's chosen not to. Somebody who decides to do their master's and their PhD could be working, but they're not. So there are a lot of valid reasons why people who could be working aren't working. But at best, this number in the last 35 years has been about 60, 66, 67 percent, which meant at any given time, more than 30 percent of the population wasn't working. That number, 66 percent in 2007, is now 62 percent. That is the real problem. A big chunk of people possibly 10 million people, uh, have just left the workforce. That's, that's an area of concern. That is not reflected in the job creation numbers. That is not reflected in the monthly unemployment numbers. So the next time somebody tells you 93% of people are working, tell them it's actually 62%, and that's dangerously low. It's dangerous because it's part of what created this economic bifurcated, economically bifurcated economy that we are growing into. The have-lots and the have-nots and the thinning of the middle class. Assuming that we were doing okay when 67% of those who could work did, the difference between that and what we have now, which I said some estimate to be about 10 million people, are headed squarely out of the middle class, past the working class, they're dropping right out of the middle class, past the working class, into an underclass, which America worked very hard in the 80s and 90s to get rid of. The idea that there was a permanently underemployed, unemployed uh, assistance receiving underclass that didn't have a road out, that didn't have an educational road out, didn't have an economic or employment road out. We are getting into that situation. I did a story just recently about towns in California that are creating safe parking lots for formerly middle class people who have lost their homes but not their cars so they can sleep in their cars at night uh, in safety. These are people who are firmly in the middle class and they have 
You know, you'd think if you drop out of the middle class, you, you grow into something, we don't use the term a lot in the United States, but Europeans will use it, called the middle class. These people have dropped right out, right down, into an underclass. They do not work. They do not have jobs. They have looked. You can, you know, I've heard people say they're lazy and they don't really look. Trust me, I know a lot of people. There aren't. If you took every available job in America and filled it, you'd still have more than 10 million people unemployed. We're also having an interesting discussion nationally about minimum wage. President Obama recently endorsed a congressional democratic plan to raise the federal minimum wage uh, from $7.25 an hour, which it stands now, to over $10 an hour, which is where it would have been had it been indexed to inflation when it first started. Uh, the municipality of SeaTac, uh, which is the municipality, it's very interesting, Seattle-Tacoma Airport has a municipality right around it, uh, so all the service providers to Seattle-Tacoma are housed there. They voted last week to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Obviously, there are strong opinions on both sides of this. I spoke to the chief economist for the National Federation of Independent Businesses last week, who argued strongly that there should be no minimum wage whatsoever anywhere in any field. So you can expect this to be a hot discussion in upcoming elections. I just heard uh, there's going to be another <clears throat> national uh, fast food workers strike uh, coming up in the next uh, few days. The last one was actually more successful than anybody would have thought. But there's a lot of space between a 725 minimum wage federally, you know, a lot of states have higher ones, and a $15 minimum wage that folks are asking for. And this is particularly tough when it comes to certain municipalities. Uh, Long Beach, California has dealt with this. Washington has dealt with this. And the problem is, if it's a municipality where the hotel workers and the fast food workers get $15 an hour, and right outside that municipality, they don't, how does that affect businesses? Do all the businesses leave? And we've all seen situations where cities have have, uh, you know, people have vacated the cities to the suburbs. Little Rock is doing a tremendous job at, at reversing that trend, but these are things one has to consider. So at a very high level, there you have my <coughs> three-legged stool. The economy is not too hot, it's uh, not too cold, but it's not too well distributed. Uh, and so as to not have my own uh, Joe the Plumber moment, I'm going to put, put off the discussion about what is fair and what distribution is all about. Let's discuss, rather, what is likely to happen with this economy. Every month we get several measures of how consumers who make decisions on 68% of all spending in this country are feeling. We get government retail sales numbers. Some retailers disclose their own sales figures. We get measures of consumer sentiment and consumer confidence to survey, uh, two surveys that generally dovetail. Though in November, interestingly enough, they both went in different directions. One shows a very pessimistic um, concerned consumer, and the other one shows a consumer that's gaining uh, strength and confidence in the economy. Very interesting. When you combine these reports, you actually get these days a mixed picture. And I'm okay with a mixed picture because I remember going through the entire recession reporting it where we'd get, you know, various economic reports every day and there was nothing mixed about them. They were all uniformly bad all the time. I prayed for the day when we would have a mixed picture. Um, one day we'll have, a, we'll have an all positive picture. We haven't seen that for a long time, but we get a mixed picture. Well off Americans, those with access to investments and access to capital, whether it's their own or borrowed, are feeling very good, spending money, and getting richer. Middle and working class Americans are feeling under pressure and they're less certain about their economic future. The entirely unnecessary shutdown of the US government took a toll on consumers, which is strange, since most people don't actually feel a very direct link to the federal government. If you weren't looking for a passport or going to a national park, you didn't have all that much to do with the federal government. Yet, the shutdown had a negative effect on consumer confidence uh, because the federal government, in allowing the government to shut down, in not dealing with a, a budget, which we haven't properly dealt with, by the way, since 2009, uh, it, it's failing in its most basic constitutionally mandated responsibility. And that makes citizens wonder who's minding the shop. That nonsense that we saw in Washington, and that's a journalistically objective term, um, last summer, uh, you know, combined with that late summer surge, well, we saw it in October, that late summer surge in mortgage rates uh, as the bond markets prepared for the Fed to pull out of the economy had a significant impact on how consumers felt. Now, we're going to have to wait a few more months. I'm not really prepared to, 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 to pass a judgment on this. We're going to have to wait a few more months for more data to see what the results of the holiday uh, shopping season will end up being, to see whether there's any real long-term effect, because fundamentally things haven't changed all that much in the last few months for the consumer, but things have made them feel a little bit more, uh, a little less optimistic. I would caution, though, that Americans 
seem rightly to have very little appetite for another budget or debt ceiling or shutdown debacle in Washington. And if the Tea Party decided to go down that route again in late January and early February, which is the next opportunity, the cost to the economy could actually be serious at that point. America cannot govern itself as a republic under siege, and the Republican Party risks not being taken seriously as a potential steward of the economy if it continues to be held hostage by a minority of its own party in Congress. And the other big what if that we're looking out for is what if the Federal Reserve under Janet Yellen, as expected, decides to stop donating $85 billion to the U.S. economy on a monthly basis. We're now more than five years into emergency measures by the central bank. We have never seen this before. One wonders what a normal economy actually looks like, one without central bank intervention. Now, this is all conjecture. I am not an economist. But experts tell me, economists tell me, that ultimately, if the Fed were to not put $85 billion into the economy every month, we could possibly expect mortgage rates to move toward their long-term normalized levels of upward of 6 percent, 8 percent, 6 to 8 percent is sort of where we would probably end up being. That seems pretty high, but for most of the 20th century, those rates would have been quite normal. It's not clear that rates would go to those high levels immediately as soon as the Fed decides to pull back or taper, as you've been hearing. That's because the Fed likely wouldn't do it all at once. They may announce that they're going to go down from 85 billion to 45 billion and slow down from there. Uh, the Fed also has at its disposal other ways to keep interest rates low. And mortgage rates are a function of supply and demand to some extent. So if banks found that uh, if rates went to 6% for mortgages and fewer people were taking mortgages, the banks could decide to uh, squeeze their margin a little bit, to, to make a little less on the rate. So you know, if demand for loans falls off too sharply, you might see those loan prices coming down. But in a world in which having a good down payment and good credit could mean an 8% uh, 30-year fixed mortgage, I mean, that's, that's very much a reality, and that is likely to moderate home price growth substantially. So we've been seeing in the last measure showed about a 13% uh, increase in the value of a house nationally. Uh, that kind of stuff may not happen with 6 or 8% mortgage rates. Credit, while cheap, is not entirely accessible today. It's much tougher to get a mortgage than it was pre-recession. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, while the median credit score needed for a mortgage has decreased, it's near impossible for a so-called subprime borrower uh, to get a mortgage, particularly if they have a small down payment, uh, at a rate that makes it worth buying a property. Because most mortgages are now not held by the lending institution, uh, they, but they're sold, they conform to more stringent requirements than they needed to before the recession. And as a result, uh, the fact that your bank knows you and that you've been a client for a long time matters a lot less now than they can check off every box on the list so that they can sell the mortgage. And that often happens the day after the mortgage is closed. One positive banking development, in my view, has been the enforcement actions that have recently been taken by a tougher uh, Justice Department and a tougher SEC. Although while many of my viewers seem very happy that J.P. Morgan Chase had to cough up $13 billion, what I think a lot of them miss is that the money, the fines, are being paid by innocent shareholders, not irresponsible bankers, and most people with a 401k or an IRA are in fact shareholders of the country's largest bank. So this may not be the victory it seems to be, and I'm unsure whether those kinds of fines will actually prevent reckless behavior on the part of banks going forward. Um, as I mentioned, I'm going to take your questions and comments in a few minutes, uh, but I want to just quickly shift to Al Jazeera for a moment. Al Jazeera America is part of the Al Jazeera Media Network, which is based in Doha, Qatar. Has anybody seen Al Jazeera English? Okay, and has, has anybody seen Al Jazeera America? Okay. Uh, the Media Network, Al Jazeera Media Network, is one of the largest in the world uh, as a news organization. Al Jazeera has a bigger news gathering footprint, which means we've got more people on the ground around the world than BBC and CNN combined. Al Jazeera now has 84 bureaus around the world compared to uh, both the BBC and CNN, which have about 40 apiece. When I worked as an anchor for CNN International, I was constantly uh, you know, hearing on my travels, why can't you be more like Al Jazeera? So now I am. <laughs> I'm often asked about the ownership and financing structure about Al Jazeera. Uh, it's more like the BBC, where the government of Qatar provides a repayable grant to a corporation which runs the Al Jazeera media network uh, than it is like the PBS, where the grant is not repayable. Uh, Al Jazeera is intended to be profitable, 
Uh, it is not publicly traded, so it doesn't have the commercial and return on investment pressures that uh, News Corporation or Comcast or Disney or Time Warner has. Uh, my news is produced in exactly the same way it was produced at CNN with all decisions made by my senior executive producer and my team. Uh, Al Jazeera America is an American staff channel. It's designed for an American audience and cannot even be watched outside of the United States. Uh, this is an important point because many who've watched Al Jazeera on their travels thought that it's great to get a different perspective and a, a global perspective on the news, but our mission is actually to be an alternative to getting your U.S. and global news from your existing TV cable sources like MSNBC and CNN and Fox. We've got 900 employees in the United States. I was higher number one. Uh, we are about the size of CNN US if it were a standalone entity. We've got 12 bureaus across the United States, including Detroit, Nashville, Seattle, Denver, and New Orleans, um, and the other cities that everybody else has bureaus in. Um, I should start by telling you, the, and I might be cutting off some questions by doing this, the name Al Jazeera means the island, which is disappointingly boring. Um, <clears throat> It refers to the entire Arabian Peninsula. Al, as you know, is Arabic for the. And my goal is that within the next few years, when someone in America utters the word Al, it is reflexively followed by Jazeera. We have some work to do on that front. Uh, many have asked why we didn't change the name for the American audience, but Al Jazeera is one of the best known brands by various uh, measures. It's the fifth most well-known brand in the world outside the United States. Uh, and we believe that Americans are open-minded and news hungry and that inside of a few years Al Jazeera will become the cable news source of record in the United States. Uh, I've been giving a lot of thought. Before I made this move I gave a lot of thought to changing viewer tastes and habits and after 12 years at CNN if I was going to make this change I needed to better understand why doing more of the obvious isn't helping to grow an audience even for long-standing brands. Cable news audience are increasingly fickle and fewer and fewer of them are turning in. The latest audience survey conducted in February among 4,000 representative Americans aged 18 to 64 underscored some segmentation trends that have been unfolding for years, and I've seen these trends go on. This national survey of consumption habits uh, confirmed facts that many outside the news industry might find surprising. For example, anybody had an idea how old the average cable news viewer is? Just shout it out. 65. 65. Now that's not all that hard to explain when you realize the younger audience gets their, you know, gets their stuff on their phone, they watch it whenever they feel like it, they're not really into watching me at 7 p.m. Eastern because I happen to be on at 7 p.m. Eastern, that's my bad fortune because they want to watch TV whenever they want to watch TV. Um, they've got hyper-specific channels, I mean when we were all growing up there was the news and you generally had three choices. Now you have lots of choices. Um, they can time shift, they get it on demand, all sorts of things. They walk it, watch it on their tablets. So scheduled news and current affairs programming is left to those who still like to get their information from an anchor or host on a channel, channel that they know or trust at a time that they're used to on an actual TV. And that tends to be older Americans. Younger audiences don't make as clear a distinction about the source of information as we've learned. They don't need to trust it as much as an older viewer does, but to them the distinction between mainstream and new, non-traditional sources of news is blurring. And what hasn't changed is the idea of choosing a curator for your news. That's what I think of myself as. Uh, it's why Oprah Winfrey and Barbara Walters and Walter Cron Cronkite reached the heights that they did. News and current affairs shows, I think, are like museums. They've always got way more inventory than they can display in their allotted time. So they choose things they think the viewers will appreciate the most, and audiences sign up for shows and anchors who they think curate most closely to their own tastes. Now the study I was telling you about revealed that 105 million Americans readily identify themselves as news consumers. Now there's a margin of error on what people say they want to watch and what they actually watch, but nearly half of the respondents had a tightly grouped area of complaints. They complain of being underserved by the existing TV and news and information offerings. That's about 49 million viewers and a major opportunity for whoever can figure out how to give them what they want. So the survey went deeper. We wanted to understand specifically what viewers thought they weren't getting. Number one, number one complaint about cable TV news, viewers want less celebrity. They're not talking about the hosts. Chief among their complaints was the intent, focus, and time that cable news and information shows spent on celebrity. What made this interesting is that the 49 million underserved viewers 
obviously this is extrapolated from 4,000, are an average of 41 years old. They're considerably younger than the average cable news viewing audience, and they like celebrities, and they like entertainment news, but they just don't want their general news so uh, sources obsessing about them at the expense of other more important stories. One common complaint was that news gets bumped for content that could just as well reside on an entertainment-focused channel or a website. And this isn't just Justin Bieber and Lindsay Lohan and who's the twerker? Miley Cyrus. But trials like uh, Jody uh, Arias or George Zimmerman that were just constantly on TV. It was frustrating to people. Uh, they felt we were creating celebrities out of, out of um, people on trial. They just don't want those rituals to play out on TV all the time. Number two complaint, they want less extremism on TV. More than 50% of respondents thought what existed on cable TV was just fine. A large proportion lamented what they see as a growing focus on ideological rifts. They think that keep cable TV encourages those rifts by, going, by giving a voice to ideological positions that are not representative, but rather that are outrageous. A common theme here is that disaffected viewers who were generally political moderates did not see their own views fairly represented on cable TV debates about important issues. They feel that extremism crowds out useful solution-based discussions. Uh, and by the way, this isn't, this isn't just about Fox or MSNBC. Fox viewers, by the way, like Fox more than anybody else likes their own station. MSNBC viewers are next, CNN viewers a uh, little less certain about what CNN is doing. Uh, but obviously, people, news channels that cater to an ideology are more likely to get greater loyalty from their viewers. Um, the viewers also wanted a clear delineation between opinion and information. Uh, they, they feel that the blurring of the line between news and commentary is confusing to them. Uh, they enjoy passion, they enjoy integrity in the, in the anchors and the hosts, but they are averse to hosts who expressly overt political partisan opinions, uh, particularly if they are in fact commentators rather than not journalists, but that that's not clearly signposted. And you'll notice when you watch TV, it's kind of hard to know. Are you an anchor or are you a host or are you a commentator? What are you exactly? They want that clarity. They feel they can't get breadth from moderators who've already decided which side is right. They definitely welcome criticism of political positions, but they want it placed in context and supported by analysis. An unabashed partnership, partisanship has turned away many entirely from cable news. These viewers also wanted more context, analysis, and depth. They, uh, the underserved viewer craves they want the media to uncover things. They, they don't want them to just tell them what happened and show them pictures of it. 46% uh, stated clearly they want more of what feels like real journalism rather than infotainment. They want reporting. Uh, and they, want, they don't just want a days full of booked guests coming on TV and, and spouting whatever they think. Uh, so what if we gave them what they wanted? Will they come? We don't know. Uh, we are going to try and do that. Uh, we, are, we are launching a channel that by the way, these are all things that fit within the Al Jazeera mandate. It's what we sort of did uh, with Al Jazeera English, which is now going to be called Al Jazeera International. The task here is to reverse an inevitable trend. The audience is aging. The audience is moving away from their TV sets onto their second screen or their tablets or their phones. Uh, and that's been a hard, hard uh, trend to, to break. It may be too late to try to convince people that those wants and needs that they articulated can be met by cable news because they've learned to live without it for so long. They've learned to live with good old-fashioned news. Um, but we're going to try. The case for Al Jazeera America is clear. The traditional audience is not growing. The disaffected audience is. A whopping 49 million people are asking for something that we have the ability to deliver. And if we didn't do that, that would just be bad business. I'll end there and, uh, and open it up to your comments, questions, uh, anything you'd like. Disagreements, agreements. Thank you very much. I'll work my way around, and I will start with you, sir, in the blue shirt. Wait one second. Oh, we're going to get you a mic. Let's get a, let's get a mic. Too. Perfect. We've got mics all over the place. Good evening. It's nice to see you. Thank you, sir. In uh, any case, uh, David Stockman last week, former OMB chairman underneath Reagan, has said that this uh, in incentive by the Fed is nothing but a uh, buildup of a bubble that we're going to pay dearly for very shortly. What are your opinions on that? Well, first of all, I think David Stockman's a, a very smart man. Uh, I've had him on my show frequently. Um, I wish there were more people around like him. I mean, he was a congressman. Uh, he's, he's really had a lot of experience, and he doesn't support um, the, the, the partisan nonsense that's been going on. Uh, 
you know, sure, there's a reason uh, stocks are up 27% today. And if the Fed weren't contributing this kind of money every month, you wouldn't see the low interest rates. You'd have other places to invest. The stock market wouldn't be the only game in town. There are a lot of people with a lot of extra money who are putting it into stocks. Um, we'd have a very different world. Uh, I think it's not outrageous to call a 27% or 35% run, run up in a year so soon after we had one in, in 2009, the possibility of a bubble. That, the other way to look at it, and my wife's the ex investment expert, is that some of these companies, some of these companies are overpriced. I mean, there are some tech companies in here that have no profits. It's very reminiscent of the late 90s. But a lot of companies in the S&P 500 have a price to earnings ratio, which is how you look at uh, what a stock should be priced at, that are still quite reasonable. Uh, I think David's right, though, that in the end, it's not feasible to sustain an economy with an $85 billion donation from a central bank. Uh, at some point, we have to make a transition from being a, uh, an economy in crisis or an emergency into one that stands on its own two feet. None of us are really clear what that entirely looks like. So, I, you know, I, I wouldn't say he's overstating it, um, but, but there's, there's some reality there. We know it's going to end, uh, and I think people should be prepared for what their portfolios are going to look like when, when the Fed's out of the game. But again, look at housing. I mean, interest rates will go up to 6%, maybe 8%, maybe over the next three years or something. So there's a lot of time to make one's necessary adjustments. I think of a bubble as, as uh, something a little more dangerous than that. I'm not sure we're there. Let's go over here. Coming behind you. Oh. Who, did you have one? Your hand up? Uh, let's go over here and then we'll go back to the yeah. back room. Thank you so much. Again, thanks for being here tonight. Your thoughts, you're very thoughtful and, Thank you. and articulate. Uh, some of us worry, uh, among the other things we have to worry about, is that even for us who we've saved some money over the years, we're in 401ks and we think we're doing the right thing. We understand that there will be vicissitudes in the markets. There'll be periods of going up and going down. And the long-term investor could, could weather these storms. Sure. But what scares some of us is that on any given day, so, a, a black swan could fly into our lives. And you know where I'm coming mm -hmm. from with this. Uh, you know, that completely unexpected event that, like the failure of Lehman Brothers, where right. McCain and, and Obama learned about it, what, 10 hours mm -hmm. before? You did, yep. you know, so w what do we do? I, you know what, yeah. I, I see where I'm coming from? You're very right, and, and it's, it's a tough argument because I, I, am, I encourage people to understand that they're, oops, you all right? Uh, <coughs> we, I encourage people to understand that there are vicissitudes and, and, and that if you are diversified well, you should be okay. But I, I really get it after the years of covering this business with WorldCom and Enron and, and Madoff and JP Morgan and, and, and Mozilla and all this. I mean, I get why people say I, there's got to be a better way to do this. Number one, the evidence works against it. In fact, there doesn't seem to be a better way to do this than to broadly invest in the market, but that's hard to help somebody overcome their, their concerns. The thing I would tell you is that if you look at all of these, these instances of event risk, starting with 9-11 uh, and after that, the recovery, with the exception of the Great Recession, which was a, uh, a confluence of a lot of black swans, um, there was no one reason for that. There were many reasons and, and some really bad regulation over the years. From everything else, we've recovered pretty fast. So even when we, walked, we talked about a potential breach of the debt ceiling <coughs> or the government shutdown, these things have some effect, but, but ultimately they, they bounce back pretty quickly. There is just no replacement for a properly diversified, non-correlated set of investments, things that don't behave the same way under the same circumstances. And really, there was one exception to this in probably the last 50 years. 2008 was the year where it didn't matter how well diversified you were, everything went down. The only people who didn't lose money are those who were in cash, which is just not a recommended way of going about business. But your gold went down, everything went down. That hasn't happened before and it hasn't happened since. So. The, the issue here is to be diversified according to your risk tolerance, and you rightly state that people have lower risk tolerance because they're more scared of things. So five years ago when people said, yeah, I can handle vicissitudes in the market, they thought that meant that sometimes it'll be 10% higher and sometimes it'll be 10% lower. Then we got into a world where it was 30% in either direction, and now you're not as willing to take a 30% risk as you were to take a 10% risk. So I always advise people to really take that part of their 
financial planning seriously, the what is your real tolerance for risk? What are you really prepared to do? And push yourself out to the edges of that as much as possible. But what you're speaking to is a general failure of understanding of financial literacy. And it's something I struggle with every day, and I've written two books on, and I wish they taught in high school, and I wish they taught in university, and I wish they taught everybody who got elected to Congress. Uh, we, we don't have it. And, and that, is, that is a real struggle of our time. I, I need people to not get out of the markets because they're scared of them because I can prove to them that they could have more than doubled their money by being in at the worst possible time. But you see these things happen and you think, gosh, they're cheating me everywhere. These guys are cheating me. The regulators can't keep up with it. It's frustrating. I'm sorry, but isn't it the case though that we One second. don't know? Isn't it true that we really don't yeah, know don't what know. the risks are? No, I mean, don't. you could say you're in low risk, you're in medium right. risk, but you don't know So I'll that. tell you two, two examples. I'll give you one, in, one good and one bad. <clears throat> and this is where I feel that legislation, good legislation could work. The CARD Act, part of Dodd-Frank, helped because you now can't market credit cards to kids under 21 years old. That is huge. That is such a big deal. That is where so many people start their bad habits. That was actually a good piece of legislation. Um, at the same time, we, don't, we have more, our banks that were too big to fail in 2008, as you know, are bigger as a piece of the economy than they were now. We still don't have that resolution authority that, that Sheila Baer said we should have, the ability for a regulator to go in and say, I, I'm going to devise a plan. They, she wanted what they call living wills for banks to say, um, I need you to do something that says what will happen if you have to come apart. We didn't get that. We're still getting resistance to that. And, and uh, 57 Republican senators, uh, uh, 47 Republican senators, argued against uh, having Elizabeth Warren becoming the head of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and now she's a senator sitting amongst them, so maybe she'll get something done there. Um, we need smart regulation. We don't need more regulation. We have too much regulation, but, but not a lot of it's smart. There are things you can actually do to systemically protect the system from falling apart. We just have to come to terms with the fact that unfettered capitalism, I'm a huge fan of capitalism, it's absolutely the best system to, to make money on in the world, but unfettered capitalism is actually dangerous. And we, we haven't gotten there yet, we're too partisan, we can't get anything done, but if somebody were to look at this, and I really do like Elizabeth Warren for this, because she is very, very thoughtful. She's hated by a lot of conservatives, but she's very thoughtful about banking and financial regulation that can actually stop some of these things from happening. We'll never stop them all, but we can stop some. That uh, lady in the back row, please. You mentioned the role of the Fed, of course, um, and you're now talking about regulation, deregulation, tax policy. Um, has the Fed been pushed into what it's done because our Congress possibly is not able to, and do you see that changing? They um, absolutely have been pushed into being the grown-ups in the room. Uh, it's, it's remarkable when, you know, twice a year the Fed uh, chair has to go to Congress and, and testify, and you listen to the nonsense questions the Fed chair gets and the accusations they get, it's like, the Fed shouldn't be involved in any of this nonsense. Uh, you know, but, but if Congress would get it done, then the Fed could step out and do what the Federal Reserve or a central bank is supposed to do. They are important institutions. In America, we've started to hate the Fed. We've got these conspiracy theorists who think that they're part of the those people with the seeing eye on the dollar. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy because they've been caused to be involved in the economy in a way that is not reasonable. That's absolutely what has happened. You've put your, your finger on it. If Congress can get down to its responsibility of, of real tax reform uh, and, and, and real economic stimulus in the right way through targeted things like infrastructure builds, which we don't take seriously in this country, uh, then the Fed can get into the business of, of monetary supply and dealing with inflation and job targets, and it doesn't have to be putting $85 billion into the economy. It's silly that the Fed's involved in this nonsense, but there's no other choice, and there hasn't been another choice. So I think we'll all be happy to see the Fed go back to its normal role of being a central bank and go back to seeing Congress. That one I'm not holding my breath for, Congress going back to its normal role. I would just be happy if Congress passed a budget. You know, people always come up with these surveys that say this is, I saw one the other day, this is the least productive Congress in the century or something. And I said, it doesn't matter. We don't need to judge Congress by whether they pass 57 bills or 570 bills. These bills may not be of consequence. I just need them to do one, the budget. We have not passed and authorized a budget since 2009 in this country, and it is the only thing that is written into the Constitution. Everything else is a, is, is, it's the only positive responsibility Congress actually has in this country, is to, is to appropriate funds, and they don't do that. So we'll have to see what happens with Congress. I do think, I do think that this 
stuff that's been going on in the last few months, if it repeats in January and February, it might be en enough to ignite Americans to say, regardless of my politics, I just don't want to send people to Congress who think that they've got a mandate to not compromise because I'm actually too busy in my life to compromise with somebody else on politics. I'm busy making a living and feeding my family. I really need you to go there and get a deal done. I'd like you to represent my interests, but not at the expense of not actually having a budget, not at the expense of the government actually shutting down. So Congress growing up is, my, I might grow hair before that happens. Thank you. In the, in the back. Oh, yeah. The guy with my haircut. <laughs> Great haircut, by the way. Thank you. Do you have any predictions relative to Obamacare? Uh, the website can't get worse. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, I'll tell you, this is one of those things, and I, I wish we could all do a better job of managing expectations on these things. You know, I was in South Africa, I was living there in 1994, and you had to see well, you will have been observing this. You, you had to have seen that a country that had operated on this system for so long that all of a sudden changed to this system, where now 100% of people had to be served in a fashion that was equal to what you know, a small percentage were getting, was going to take 15, 20, 25 years to evolve. You wouldn't be able to judge South Africa's success for 20 or 25 years. And everybody for the ensuing years was talking about what a terrible, violent, horrible society uh, you know, South Africa was. Well, what did you, I mean, come on, guys, we're changing a system here. Healthcare, you're not going to see the benefit of this thing for 10 to 15 years. It's a complete shift. All the pricing's going to be off. People are going to be paying more than they thought. People will be getting insurance who didn't have insurance. I mean, this is, I don't know why we, why we ever sold this as a panacea that we did. It's probably necessary. I mean, you're talking to a Canadian. I grew up uh, in a system where everybody gets health care and no matter where you are in the political spectrum, you believe that health care is a right that everybody should have. It's not the best system in the world, but everybody gets it. And it takes a long time, and if you're not bleeding out of your eyes, you might sit around for a while and, and wait. And sometimes you can be in a lot of pain and wait six months to get an MRI. I'm not, it's not the best system in the world. But these are works in progress. So the obsession about the website is a little frustrating to me because it's a website. It's 2013. We put a man on the moon many decades ago. We'll get the website right. They should have gotten it right in the first place, but they didn't. Uh, I, I think we have got to just see how this plays out. And, and I think we reserve judgment for at least a few years uh, to see where these prices go. I mean, the United States pays twice as much per capita on health care than most industrialized nations. Now, you, you've, you've probably uh, all seen my friend Sanjay Gupta, who says, if you're really sick, uh, there's nowhere you want to be other than in America with insurance. If you'd rather not get sick, there are a lot of other countries that are better, you know, because of their health care system. So I think we've just got to see how this plays out. If it does what it's supposed to do by getting a lot of poor people who were uh, not getting health care and, and costing the system a lot more because they were getting uh, terrible diseases that could have been curable that people with health care don't suffer from or get treated for, the reduction just in diabetes treatment, if there are a significant re reduction in obesity, would more than pay for the cost. So, you know, it's one of those things. We just got to see how it plays out. I'm just not smart enough to know how it should. I, I should probably disclose that I, I grew up in a system where everybody had health care, so I fundamentally think it's a good thing, but it's not going to be without its problems. We have time for two quick ones, yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, two really quick questions, please, uh, on the market. If the market is either overvalued or artificially propped up, are we looking at a big sell-off in the short term? I mean, this market's been going strong for a long time. Uh, I, if I knew enough about whether there'd be sell-offs or not, I'd be calling this in from my yacht. Uh, <clears throat> so I never know and never get it right. Um, you know, again, I, I, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people. One of the problems of speaking to people in the market to get advice about the market is that it's never a cloudy day for them until the cloud is right above them and it bursts into rain. Uh, so a lot of people I've been talking to are staying invested. They still feel that they're good buys at a market at these levels, you have to be a little more selective. Uh, you know, you have to start to sort of understand how different stocks operate in this kind of economy. If the Fed's pulling out and it becomes harder to borrow money, uh, companies with strong cash positions might be more useful. Uh, obviously, dividend companies have fallen out of some favor because why bother? You can make money elsewhere. So I don't know. I, I don't know if we see across the board sell-offs. Uh, I think they're, let me put it this way. Everybody I talk to says there might be buying opportunities, so you should, keep, you should keep your powder dry if you happen to have some. Sure, after the market crashes, it's a great time to buy. They're on sale. 
but, well, but, uh, but it's true, and that's yeah. unfortunately exactly the moment where everybody goes away. Yeah. Uh, second quick question, uh, if you would, please. Uh, is, there, is there a tipping point on the size of the national debt? Is there a point where we just have a good too much debt? That's a very, very, <coughs> it's a very good question. The tipping point may have more to do with uh, the algorithm of our ability to pay that debt as opposed to the actual amount of debt. I mean, if you're, if you're in a fast growth economy, it, it matters a lot less that you have debt. So growth, which is sort of to my argument about jobs, because to me jobs are about growth. Growth can outpace debt. Our problem is we don't have growth that outpaces our debt. We're actually getting there. It's just not as much of a problem as it was. The, the bigger problem is the constant threat to not pay our debt, because that's where you start toying with, with, with people who say, well, I'm going to lend my money to places that actually don't ever uh, dangle that. Uh, we're not there yet. I think it's important to know that you just can't go on in this unsustained fashion. It doesn't cost us anything as Americans to have debt. We don't know what it feels like. You wouldn't know. I mean, you, you brought a Martian down here and said, do we have debt or not? They wouldn't know. So unless we feel it, we don't know that it could be a bad thing to have too much of it. We're not becoming Greece. We're nowhere near becoming Greece, and people used to use that analogy. But there is a point at which there can be too much debt, and generally speaking, it's a trajectory. Uh, and we're not on the right trajectory just yet. We're sort of, we could get there, but we're not, and it still requires greater employment. That is going to be the best thing we can do. More productive people, creating more demand, creating more businesses. Uh, that's, that's the virtuous cycle that we need to get into. Good time for one more? Last question, yeah. Hi, I'm Bolton Kirshner, and I'm a student here at the school. Um, you discussed the importance of job growth, monthly job growth, and you said that there were different uh, implementation ways that weren't mm -hmm. being used currently. Can you discuss what those are? <coughs> Meaning the measures or? or the, um, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> you said there are ways to grow uh, monthly jobs. Well, this is a very good question. I think there are ways to grow jobs. I don't think it's up to presidents. You know, I think it's got very little to do with the president. Presidents get, get too much blame and too much credit for job creation. Uh, job creation, so here, you look at this country and you look at the frustrations with politics in Washington and what you, what you miss sometimes is that there are some remarkable things going on in states. So my biggest pet peeve is that we should, be, uh, we should have a national infrastructure bank and we should be fixing and building everything. I mean, every time I travel to other countries, everybody, little, little podunk countries around the world are building fascinating high-speed rails and, and bridges and dams and all sorts of things, and America's just letting it all crumble. But states are fixing these things. Municipalities are coming up with creative ways of financing and, and doing things. And these kinds of things create jobs in the long term because we have too long associated job creation with stuff we do. So this was the mistake in trying to sell the stimulus plan because we said it's going to create X number of jobs. And then everybody started measuring whether or not there were actually that many jobs in the construction and the repaving of I-95 and all this. That's not what this is for. You don't fix I-95 to create 10,000 jobs. You fix I-95 so that you've got a road system that actually works. You build high-speed rail so that people actually use it and the cities on, and the terminals you know, prosper. You, you fix bridges so that businesses uh, operate, so that our infrastructure gets through, our, our transportation. You fix our docks and our ports for that reason. And we don't think about it in those terms. And that's the, we need nationally to think the way a lot of states are thinking and saying, let's build what's not competitive about this country. Because stop looking at the next five years. The economy, it goes up and down. It will fix itself. We'll have jobs. We'll even have a shortage of jobs probably in about six years, uh, meaning a shortage of people. But what will happen? Why will we be more competitive than India? Why will we be more competitive than China? Why not more competitive than Finland, which has a better education system than we do? Or South Korea, which has the best wireless structure, infrastructure in the world? We need businesses to come here and hire our people to do things, as opposed to going to the cheapest places possible, because the cheapest places possible are building better infrastructure than we are. So those are the kind of discussions that have to take place. We don't build infrastructure because people think it's somebody else's pork. It's going into somebody's district. Uh, it's not managed properly because it's government. Everywhere in the world has public-private pri partnerships except America. The only public-private partnerships we largely have on a federal level are airports. You know, we, Everybody else does it that way. We don't know how to do that. Government doesn't trust business. Business doesn't trust government. We need to start thinking that way. I'd like a few more business people in Congress. I'd like everybody to understand uh, some basic economics. There are ways that Congress can create an environment that creates more jobs. Taxation, by the way, is another very important role. We need real tax reform, not just willy-nilly increases and decreases. Really look at this and say, how do, we, how, do we, how do we incentivize success? 
We, we, we're not looking at that. Again, it's like your question. It's going to be a while before we have a Congress that gets around to it. The good news about America is whether or not Congress gets down to it, businesses do. America still remains innovative. People are really good at creating, and they continue to. Congress is a bit of a blob in the middle, and the water just flows around it.